Brother Ken has given me an idea in our fun, and I don't know whether he's thought about it or not. I'd be surprised if he hadn't regarding that word beginning. Do you know when you begin to study your Bible, when you begin to study your Bible, one of the things we always urge is to note the words, the use of words. We got into some of that in class this morning. We talked about how different people have the same names. And you can look at the word beginning. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. Old Testament, Genesis 1 1. Then you can look at what John said. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. But then there's an interesting thing, and it involves the emphasis on handling a right or rightly dividing the Word of Truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Because you'll notice that when Peter was talking about what happened, at the household of Cornelius and the Holy Spirit had come directly from heaven upon the household of Cornelius he said that reminded him of what happened at the beginning now you take all three of those verses and you've got in English beginning well, does Peter mean the same thing in his use of the beginning as does John or Moses? And certainly it's not the case. So it shows you that how even in fun we can draw from that a lesson as to words and their meanings and their definition and the context how they change things. And if you let a man define his own terms, he can have all sorts of beginnings. <laughs> but you will never study the Bible as fully as you're able to if you don't realize the importance of words. Now that's an introduction I have to my real sermon today <laughs> that I didn't intend to use to get into it because I'm going to study another word and that word is honesty honesty is one of those words we use a lot and the Holy Spirit and the inspired penman used a lot of, uh, use it a lot too but like a lot of words and we get into this in class sometimes words that we use so much when you come right down to having to write out in specific terms just what is the definition of honesty, that uh, sometimes can be a problem. Again, back to why word studies when you study the Bible is so important because God has placed the way we go to heaven in the meaning of words. So much so that when Paul told Timothy about the importance of preaching the gospel, the glad tidings of Christ, the power of God to save us, Romans 1, 16, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, he said, preach the word. And there, that term, word, W-O-R-D, stands for the whole New Testament system. Even as when Jude said, contend for the faith, that it's a part of the New Testament system of salvation, but it's pulled out and held up to say, I'm talking about the whole New Testament system. So studying words is very important. And this business of honesty is tremendously important. Look at what Peter said in 1 Peter 2 and verse 12 concerning our conduct. When I say our conduct, I mean Christian conduct in the Lord's church. And I'll start in verse 11 to lead us into verse 12. 1 Peter 2, beginning 11. Dearly beloved. Now that's the attitude we ought to have toward one another in everything. Dearly beloved. 
Notice his approach. I beseech you. I, I fall on bended knee before you because of your relationship or lack of it to the way the world thinks and lives. Because you are as strangers and pilgrims, as faithful members of the body of Christ in this world. Let me pause there and dwell on that for a moment. The longer I live trying to understand the truth and put it into practice in my life and view this world, the more I feel myself and a stranger to it. The people of this world are not motivated by the truths of the Bible. If they don't know what the Bible teaches because someone's taught them or they've read it, then they're pretty much left to themselves. Now they may because the Bible has been so much a part of the fabric of the United States be doing a lot of things right because that's just the way it's been done and it's become a part of the habitual conduct. But you see how fast that changes. So I don't know how a Christian over a period of years doing what God says a Christian ought to do to properly wear that name cannot have the people of the world stranger to him all the time. And not realize more and more that we're just passing through this world. That this is temporary and provisionary. A place to prepare for our long home. Now that's how Peter approaches them. And he says, in view of the fact that that's what you are if you're faithful to God, dearly beloved, as I beg you, then abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. What do fleshly lusts do? They war against the soul. They war against living on the spiritual plane God says being faithful is. Then he comes to our verse with that background. Because it's not the end of the sentence at verse 11. It's the beginning of the sentence with dearly beloved. Having your conversation. Now today conversation of course means speaking to one another. Conversing. But in those days, as some of the uh, American Standard, or especially uh, the New King James Version, talks about your conduct in the world. Harkening back to the teaching that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So having your conversation, the way you live, your conduct, honest. Now there's our word. That's the word I want to spend the rest of the time on. How does a Christian, by his conduct, set forth an honest life. Notice he says, among the Gentiles. Paul pointed out to the Corinthians, to get away from the world, you would have to leave this world. And he was showing why, that therefore, the disciplinary action of the church toward an unfaithful brother who wouldn't repent is just for the church to deal with because you certainly can't get away from worldly people. You're around them as neighbors. You're around them in your family. You're around them at school and at work. They're there. They always will be. They were then, they have been, they will be. And they were before that time. Peter knows that. Having your manner of life, the way you live, honest among the Gentiles. Among them. You know, we're expected to be the leavening for good. Well, you can't leaven for good if you're not in the dough. <laughs> you can't do it. But you're not of the dough, but you leaven the dough. Now, that can be used as the Lord did when he talked about the leavening of the Pharisees, which was hypocrisy, binding on others what they wouldn't begin to bind, and not binding only the law of Moses. But then he talks about the church having members who were living ungodly and refusing to repent. The little leaven, leaven of the whole lump. But it's still leaven, but it permeates the lump, whether it's good leaven or bad leaven. But notice that the Gentiles, representative of lost people, non-Christians, pagans, worldly people. He says, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now the point is, 
Though they call you all sorts of names, though they say you're evil, though they misrepresent what you teach and how you live and your worship and so forth, they can't deny the good you do to others. Does that make us see more why James 1.27 is so important and would have been where people who are pagans don't care for human life at all and yet pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and their afflictions, the widows and orphans and their afflictions, keep oneself in spotted from the world? So pure and undefiled religion involves caring for those who cannot provide for themselves. And not to live on the level of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's worldly. And Peter makes it very clear that you are to live honest among the Gentiles. In other words, among people who aren't necessarily honest, and many times they don't care whether they're honest or not as long as me, me, me is satisfied. But you can treat them honestly. You can keep your word. You can be full of good works as the New Testament defines, good works for members of the church. They can't deny that when you're doing those things. You see, this verse would mean far more to us if we lived in an age where there were not so many social programs provided by local, state, and federal government. But where people can't go down and get this and that and the other for help. They don't have it, they don't have it. I firmly believe, from what I understand of the Word of God, that God really intended the family and the church to be the suppliers of benevolent activity and not the government. I think it's complete corruption of civil government as presented in the Scriptures. It doesn't mean that the government in view of what the Bible defines civil government to be in Romans 13 and other places. Can't support those good works because it comes right out and specifically says it's to not be a terror to good works. But it's like understanding there are three God-ordained institutions in this world. They did not originate with man, but they're for the good of man. The first was the family, the second civil government, and the third the church. And when... The Word of God pertaining to all of them. Because sitting here this day, we're part of all of them. When the Word of God is understood and practiced, then we will see the cooperation that God intended to be between all three institutions, and there won't be any usurpation by one institution over the other of power or in goods and services provided. But we can't get people to understand the plan of salvation, much less get them to go into that knowledge of the truth because it's not so much milk as in studying this as it is a little more meaty. So we do well just to get people to understand how to become a Christian, the steps to plan of salvation, what it means in your life, the church, its work, organization, and worship, and what's involved in worship. And frankly, we do well to keep the church to understand that. But honesty is what you must be. You will not go to heaven without being honest. Any more than you can accidentally go to heaven. Honesty is behavior. In action and words. And we probably don't think of this next one. That aims to convey the truth. It's truth in action. A dishonest person, the absence of honesty, may handle the truth in a bad way. You know, Paul talked about those who handle the truth deceitfully. He also talked about false teachers, such as in 1 Timothy 4. They had heard the gospel from the heart, obeyed it, had lived Christian lives. But the Spirit spoke expressly to Paul, saying, Some shall depart from the faith. Now there's that word faith again, as we talked about in the beginning. In Jude 3, they left the system of salvation, the gospel system, the New Testament system. They may not have left all of it, but you don't have to leave and reject the whole New Testament system to be in sin. 
Just reject one component part of it pertaining to your salvation, either in becoming a Christian or living the Christian life, and you're down the drain. Because any time you violate any body of law in one point, the whole body condemns you. And the New Testament is the perfect law of liberty, James 1 and verse 25. Thus, we need to know the New Testament and how it authorizes and that we have authority from the New Testament for all we believe in practice and know the difference in those obligatory matters that one must believe and comply with and as a member of the church to be a Christian to discharge those obligations. Now, for someone totally ignorant of the Bible, you say, my, that's, that's asking a lot. Do you think it's asking a lot? For a person to go through four years of college and then law school. In fact, it's even called in law school the paper chase because you're reading so much you can't keep up with it. They cram it on you. But I, I, if I ever have to have a lawyer, I want, I want somebody that understands the law. And you won't understand it if you don't read it. Study it. Same thing's true of any profession. Architect. Various kinds of engineers, medical doctors, whatever. Doesn't make any difference. So why do we think it's strange that God would say, here's my will to save you from your sins. I didn't have to do this, but I loved you, even when you were yet sinners. And here it is to tell you how to be saved by the grace of God through the gospel of Christ that extends mercy to all men who believe and obey it in being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins and then living faithful lives. I don't believe God is saying that here's what's required of you to be faithful, but I know you can't do it anyway. What kind of a God would that be? Who would want to serve him? He's a monster. God hasn't given us anything we can't understand and do that's necessary for our salvation. And being honest is necessary. Behavior and action and words that aims to convey truth. The quality is an essential aspect of God's own nature and purposes and is required of those whom he calls to be his people. Required. That's obligatory. Do you remember, and I some time ago was saying quite a bit about this, haven't lately, but you'll remember it. Luke 8, 15, verse 11 says the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. And then he gives you different kinds of ground. Only one of them. The seed will grow in. Which means the mind is such that the word of God will mean what it ought to mean. And God expects it to mean and it must mean if you're going to be saved from your sins. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart. Having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Well, if you don't have an honest heart. You're not going to have a good heart, and you'll not believe and obey the gospel for any period of time anyway. You won't stick with it. Something else will draw you away. Something else will become more important. Something else will grab your interest. That's why that Paul says, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, you may be laboring a lot in the field of work you decide you're involving yourselves to do to earn a living. You may study it and it involves a lot of knowledge, and over the years you gain a lot of it. But it's all going to come to naught when this world disappears and this age is gone. What will abide will your knowledge, your knowledge of the truth and an honest heart in practicing that truth. That will abide. You can destroy everything there is about this world, including your physical body, and that will abide. Paul said to the Romans in Romans 12, 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Now, notice all men means the church as well as everybody else. Now, that ties back in somewhat to what we were saying earlier that Peter talked about. Having your conversation, your conduct honest among the Gentiles. Well, why, Peter? Whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God. In other words, you can't deny the good a person does and you see it. I don't care how much you deny God in Christ and the Bible. 
you know that person did good. And that's exactly what's being said here about honest in the sight of all men. Do you know that says a lot about who we associate with outside the church? Maybe even some of our family members. Or other organizations. Do you want, say you're a member of some other organization besides the Lord's church. Is it an organization that you would have all your brothers and sisters be a part of and acting accordingly? Does not the church of Christ, as that term, in other terms, referring to the same body of the saved, does it not satisfy all our longings? And is that not where our labor should really be put to practice? If not, then pray tell what does seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things should be added. What does it mean? How do you apply it? How is it practical in the things that you do? In 2 Corinthians 8, 21, he says virtually the same thing he did to the Romans. Providing for honest things. Not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. You know, there are those things that are neither right nor wrong within themselves. But people attach things to them as to their significance of good or bad. We as children of God in those areas of life don't want to be involved in something that sends a message God doesn't want sent to other people. When Paul says, I became all things to all men that I might win some, he didn't mean that to say, well, I disobeyed God in order to get people to obey God. He's talking about cultural differences, societal differences that had made no difference one way or the other. In a Russian house, as is true of a lot of places in Asia, it is just common practice when you go through the door, you take off your shoes. I think probably it would be a good custom here, except some of my grandkids never put shoes on. And a lot of women I know working in the house will go barefooted all day long. But that's a custom that shows respect to the house. I know it was in Russia and in other places that you took your shoes off and they had a whole pile of slippers there for you to slip on as you walked around the house. And that certainly leaves a lot of dirt outside. <laughs> and when you're up Murmansk and there's snow up your ears, uh, slush and then freeze again and all that, you leave a lot of things outside where it ought to be when you do that. And they even have entrances where you take your coat off, and change your shoes, and you go on in the house. So those things, they're right and wrong within themselves. They're not necessarily sinful. But you want to show respect for the people whose culture you're in. And thus providing things honest, not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of men. I've mentioned many times the left hand in Muslim countries. Well, they're, their religion's wrong. Look what they're doing to us. I'll just extend to my left hand every time. Please don't go over there and try to teach them the gospel. Please don't do that. Because it's going to be bad. <laughs> yeah, but that's not right. Blah, blah. Well, you're not even strong enough as a Christian. If you did, you'd understand these words. And so it comes down to even this country. And isn't our goal to have all people converted to Christ and all that that means? And the church growing in knowledge and practice of the truth and concern for the souls round right about us? And more and more people are void of the knowledge of the Bible. And where do you begin with people like that? Philippians 4, 8, notice what Paul said concerning how we should think. Finally, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. The very next thing is whatsoever things are honest. What do we say about that? What, what behavior and action and words, honesty that aims to convey the truth. You see, I want to, above all, convey the truth of the gospel to everybody I'm around. Now, that's how you're a good example, and that's how you're leavening for good as you're among the world. That's why Peter talked about being ready to give an answer or make a defense to everyone and ask if you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. By your actions, you can call people and say, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Well, that's a pulpit creator <laughs> that's just simply an opportunity it would help if we would change our 
perspectives and views of when people ask us questions that challenge us that we don't draw up in a knot but say let me tell you I'm glad you asked buddy isn't that a good salesmanship thing I'm glad you asked I've got something you need well if Christians don't have something the world needs as the Bible defines Christian and what the church is commanded to do in spreading the gospel I'd like to know who's going to give it to them Who's go, who has it? In 2 Corinthians 13, 7, Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. That's the same type of comment he's making over in Romans 12, 2 Corinthians 8, 21. They call you everything. Some of you may have seen, well, it's in the bulletin. I didn't know she was going to pick it up and use it, about um, the thing I saw years ago when I was in Rome, a graffiti on the Palatine Hill where somebody scratched something on the wall, you know, we, people did that then and a long time before. And I didn't go into in that article how it was preserved over the years, and I won't now, save to say that it was covered up and how it got covered up and stayed there till the mid-19th century. Some archaeologists dug it up. But it's just scratching on the wall but it depicts someone being crucified and there's a head of a donkey with a person scratched out in kind of stick form worshiping the figure on the cross. And it's a mockery of Christians worshiping someone who was crucified. Well, crucifixion is a bad thing as we have it explained to us, but we don't realize it was reserved for those who rebelled against the power of Rome who actually rebelled against it. That's why Pilate had to show everybody why he was crucifying Jesus and he had that sign put above his head in three different languages. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. And the Jews didn't like that, but he had given in to them because they said, no, no, take it down and put he said he was. And he said, I've written what I've written. You see, that was a political ploy on his part because you're not supposed to use crucifixion just to punish murderers. Use crucifixion who lead to, uh, on people who, are, who, who rebel against the power of Rome. And Rome would put up about anything but somebody that challenged their authority and power to rule. And anytime somebody got into that position from their perspective, they took the viewpoint, we're going to show you who has the power. Thus crucifixion, and thus they crucified Christ. Not knowing they figured into the very plan of God. It was the most shameful thing because they would leave the bodies most of the time on the cross till they were in sad shape. Because you see, most of the, of, the, of the Near Eastern people wanted to show respect for dead bodies. And they would take them down. As if you will look at the description in the Bible of how they treated Jesus' body when they took it down, then you'll see they treated it with respect as having been the house the Spirit lived in. That's where we have, over the years, though we don't know it, shown respect for the dead body. So the Romans did that usually. Now, do you remember, and of course it all figured in the prophecies of God. Do you remember how it was that Jesus' body was taken down with the cross? Because they might linger for two or three days on that cross or longer before they died. Well, that's why they broke their legs, because they died of asphyxiation. They can't hold themselves up, and so they suffocate. But Jesus was dead already, and he kept fulfilled the prophecy that none of his bones were broken. So they run that spear in his side for good measure. Now, normally, they would have left them on there, but they gave concession to the Jews and their religion, and that was the Sabbath coming up. So the Jews went to Pilate and said, can we have his body? And he acquiesced, and they took it down. But the Romans wanted people to know that if you lead an insurrection against us, it will be one of the most painful, horrible deaths you can undergo. And then your body will be displayed in as most shameful way as possible. So here this is thought to be roughly 200 A.D. is this graffiti that depicts that. And it calls the name of the person Worshipping his God. Now what I did mention in the article, if you went over another room or two as they discovered this stuff, 
Evidently, Christians took up for him because they scrawled on walls, so-and-so is a faithful servant of God. Have we ever lived in a society like that? But they lived. They lived it daily. Do you understand better why Paul said this in the first century when Rome was at its pinnacle of power? And all these pagans, they're not Baptist, Methodists, and so forth. They don't believe in God. They think it's strange and crazy. But you live a righteous life. You be honest with yourself and God. And you live a righteous life before everybody. So when they make these charges against you, it can't stick. Because really, when they produce the facts of how you live, it does not stand up to what they've charged you with. Now look at Paul pleading his own case before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa, and you'll know what he said when he stood before Nero many years later because he'd appealed to Caesar. And he would make the statement when it was said by Agrippa, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He says, not almost, but altogether, such as I am, except these bonds. That was an opportunity for Paul. He was scared to death to have the might against him. And even they concluded, this man's nothing worth, nothing worthy of death. Even as Pilate had concerning Jesus. But what did the Jews do? Well, here's our evidence that he has led an insurrection against Rome. No, their answer was, crucify him, crucify him. Have you ever noticed that people don't have any proof? They just keep restating the same thing over and over again. Watch these mobs that roam the streets and you'll see how that works. It always has been. Said enough, it must be true. 2 Corinthians 13, 7, now I pray to God that you do no evil. Not that we should appear proved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be reprobates. That's the way we need to think today and more and more in the secular society that challenges the existence of God. And I'll leave you with this last verse. Paul said to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, 2, but have renounced, speaking of Christians, the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience into the sight of God. Well, that's just really touching the hem of the garment on this study of honesty. Real quickly, it has to do in honesty with what's good and ex excellent and honorable as God defines it. It has to do with seeing things strictly from God's perspective in the light of His Word. Some words that are used in English to define it, that which becometh or becoming, we don't use it much anymore, that which becometh a Christian. That which shows you that you are Christ-like in the works that you do. And of course we know how much the Bible says that we're to be ready unto every good work. That we're to be full of good works. Because those who may not sit down and study the Bible with you, they hear your words. They see your actions. They see the way you conduct yourself and how you deal with one another. And how you deal with them in particular. In a world grown mad, they know. And that gets their attention. Well, today, I hope this has helped us see better what it is to be honest before God and before everyone else. Now, are you honest with yourself? Are you honest with yourself before God in the light of His Word? Are you a Christian? As the Bible defines Christian. If not, you need to believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him and be buried in baptism for the remission of your sins. As a child of God, if you've sinned, are you honest with yourself to keep trying to hide that sin because it's not hidden with God? You need to be honest and repent of it, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. Cultivate honesty. Work on it. And provide things honest in the sight of all men. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, please come while we stand and sing.